first one is that in these both very interesting examples about mobilizing diaspora financing in DFID, we don't have um, a significant amount of experience in terms of the kind of mobilization of remittances for organized public sector activities in the way the Mexican example um, demonstrated. Where we've tended to position ourselves has been very much about seeing remittances as an entry point to um, financial inclusion and development of the financial sector. And we've been through quite a sort of re-engineering about how we think about financial inclusion and trying to see our financial inclusion work through the sort of following the remittance money. And that's actually led us to do a significantly uh, increased amount of work on some of the basic payment systems that facilitate um, remittances and keep the cost down in the way that we were talking about in the um, previous discussion. It, it, you know, one of the reasons for that is very much that remittances are often the first point of contact for poor people with the financial sector. And thinking about financial inclusion from a remittance point of view is, is very much sort of where we are in terms of the development end and the development impact piece of remittances. And we've done a lot of work. We've got a project called the Remittance and Payments Partnership Project that's been reinforcing those links and trying to use remittance flows to build financial in inclusion. Lots of good examples of that. I think time's short. I won't uh, go through all of those. I mean, I think one of the ones that's most interesting is the one in Bangladesh, where we've also focused very much on the interoperability of the payment system. So we're beginning also to just really bring down the transaction costs involved with accessing remittances and joining up the, um, the, the payment system and allowing the mobile money system to talk to the rest of the banking system. Um, uh, and we've come to that through, through thinking about remittances more um, in terms of the development angle and what they can achieve. I think the other couple of things I was going to say, um, I mean, I've been challenged a lot uh, in the morning as, uh, as a member of the UK government about um, the, the risks to the remittance uh, sector um, and, you know, the, the fact that remittance markets are facing new risks as, bank close account, as banks close accounts for remittance service providers is something we are very alive to and very concerned about in in the UK government. So we very much turned our attention to that set of issues um, and have turned our attention perhaps a bit away from the end use of remittances to really try and put energy into, in, into thinking about how to address all the issues that people have been talking about this morning. I do agree with um, Kevin's challenge uh, this morning that this is essentially about having a really hard look um, at regulation and at how the regulatory uh, and development perspectives can be brought together. And um, that's why in the UK government we have set up um, this new action group on cross-border remittances that's bringing together the the, the regulators in the UK government with the private sector, civil society and, and international players to address these risks. And it is a very interesting challenge actually. And we think from the development side that there is some quite effective work that we can do to be able to begin to shift um, the risk perception of the banking sector. So although I think Dominic said earlier that the banks are making very rational and understandable decisions at the moment. They are decisions based on perceived risk and our role as a development agency is partly to enter that space and begin to work on ways to change perceptions of risk and that's what we're trying to do. Um, all that information is out there on a website, that UK Action Group on Cross-Border Remittances um, is publicising what it's doing including the way it's working with the um, MSBs, the money service businesses, um, and also the way it's working with the banks. The, the final point I wanted to make um, is around the Somali Safe Corridors project. Um, Somalia is probably the country where the kind of things people have been talking about just now, the ambassador's talking about in terms of 
thinking about whether there are ways to organize remittances more coherently for development is sort of that kind of work is you know it's I think it is crying out to be to be done nevertheless we have this fundamental concern about the stability of flows to Somalia which is why at the moment our energies are going into the safe corridors project um, we are confident that that's going to be a good project um, there have been challenges to me during the course of the morning about um, the nature of that work and whether it's going to be a slow pondering elephant or the speedy tiger that I think everybody wants it to be. I think the approach to building up a safe corridor whilst Somali's own regulatory capacity develops um, is the right one to do. And I think working on the customer due diligence at both the sending and receiving ends as the safer corridor pilot will do and also working on a an auditable um, trail um, so that we get a trusted third party to audit that trail. I think that will work and we will have a, a strong pilot and, and as that <coughs> builds I think there is an opportunity for us to think more imaginatively about the actual <coughs> user end of remittances and whether, whether there is more we can do kind of in the kind of space that the ambassador and also the um, Ethiopian council has been talking about. Excellent, thank you very much indeed.